All right, so we're in the book of Judges, and we're in chapter 13, uh, the final judge, uh, the, many believe the 13th judge, uh, if we include uh, in that um, the, the, the man who wanted to be king, Abimelech. But anyway, let's uh, begin reading in verse 1, and we'll read down to verse 14, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the birth of Samson. And so it says, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For, lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And now drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman And she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And again, God will bless that reading of his word to us uh, this morning. So as we consider this section, we we did uh, the last time we met a couple of weeks ago, we did a little bit of the background of the chapter. And uh, remember verse one, it says the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, despite having a period of peace, uh, having judges that maintained peace, and they were not under dominion or anything like that. But they, they still followed their pattern of doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And so it says the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, I want to just go back a little bit to chapter 10, just to notice something that we uh, observe back there in chapter 10. It says in verse 7, it says, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And so uh, this is the, the, the mention of so selling them into the hands of the Philistines. Now, uh, we look to the story of Jephthah and how he delivered them from Ammon. And now we're going to see how Samson will begin to deliver them from the Philistines. But these two, and remember, one was coming from the east, one was coming from the west. And so they were putting Israel under pressure from both sides. And so this is uh, the attack that is coming uh, from the west, from the Philistines on the west coast there of Israel. And so this is the the second uh, aspect of that promise in chapter 10, 10, verse 7. 
And we also mentioned that 40 years was the longest time of servitude in the whole of the book of Judges. And what is quite remarkable about it was that even after 40 years, they actually don't cry out for deliverance. Normally, uh, there is repentance, there's a crying out to the Lord, and then the Lord raises up a deliverer. In this instance, there's no record whatsoever of them crying out for deliverance. In in fact, uh, although they were in the hand of the Philistines and under the bondage of Philistine rule, they had settled down and accepted it as the way it was. And they, they, they were content to live in slavery, <laughs> uh, in bondage, basically, and nobody cried out. And yet, here's the wonderful truth. If we don't get anything else this morning, get this, that even though they didn't cry for deliverance, the Lord in his grace, raised up a deliverer. And sometimes the Lord does things that we don't pray for, (laughs) right? Because God is gracious and he loves his people. And so isn't it wonderful to know, it's wonderful that he answers prayer, but it's also wonderful to know that sometimes he acts on our behalf and we haven't even asked. We've not asked anything. We haven't prayed about it. In fact, uh, we were content in our situation and the Lord still uh, raised up some help, some deliverance, Uh, in the midst of it. Also, um, the the Philistines were a much more serious threat than Jephthah faced uh, from the Ammonites in this sense that um, this is the only judge where there's not complete deliverance. We'll we'll notice that he began to deliver Israel. He's going to start it, but it's going to take all the way to the time of David before full deliverance comes from the Philistines. Was there going to be a thorn in Israel's side for a long, long time? But he's the man that started uh, the deliverance. And so we want to recognize that, that he was the man that did this. But certainly was a very serious threat. So in the midst of this bleak scene, 40 years of bondage, people apathetic, content with their miserable condition, they're not crying out to God, and yet God begins to move and begins to affect deliverance. And again, he, he can't find an adult ready for the job. The previous judges already were alive and kicking and doing their work and all the rest of it. This time, uh, he has to start fresh uh, with a newborn baby. And that's, again, going to take time, the whole him developing and maturing, all the rest of it. Uh, but, but again, it's just an interesting situation, very different to the other judges. So it tells us, verse 2, there was a certain man of Zora of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. <clears throat> so there's a certain man of Zora, And again, uh, scholars would tell us that Zora. Uh, this interesting little place means nest of hornets, uh, quite the name uh, to, to uh, have for a town, uh, the town of the nest of hornets. It doesn't sound like a great place to live, uh, a, a place called the nest of hornets. Um, and I would think it would be quite uncomfortable. Um, I remember when we lived in Georgia, where I used to keep my my lawnmower, there was a hornet's nest that developed there. And every time I had to cut the grass, I had to kind of deal with these things. And I'm telling you, uh, several times I got stung. And those things can give you a nasty sting. They're, they're quite powerful. And they come at you at such speed uh, and hit you. And anyway, they're not pleasant. And so living in a place called Nest of Hornets would hardly be uh, a good place to live. And uh, <clears throat> it reminds a little bit, too, of our enemy and his fiery darts. <laughs> Just like these hornets come at you fast and hit you. Well, the fiery darts of the evil one like to bring us and sting us like that of a hornet. And so uh, we're certainly living in days like that, di- difficult days. And uh, the enemy is se- extremely busy uh, seeking to hurt the people of God wherever they turn. Uh, Zara was a small town about 14 miles or 22 kilometers west of Jerusalem in the territory of Dan. And Dan occupied the smallest landmass of any of the tribes 
and it was the last tribe to receive its inheritance. And so it, it basically what it's telling us is that this deliverer is coming out of less than ideal circumstances, a, a difficult place, a hornet's nest, uh, a tribe that is not exactly filled with honor. Uh, we'll think more about that in a moment. And so uh, a very humble setting for the birth of the deliverer, the savior. And again, we're going to point out that actually Samson, and yes, far from perfect, but Samson is a beautiful type of Christ in certain ways. Now, again, we recognize the Lord Jesus is totally different in many ways, but in some ways. And so, of course, we're reminded of the fact that the Lord Jesus came from an obscure place, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Uh, again, a small, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. So, again, it wasn't exactly uh, the big city, the, the metro area. Uh, again, little amongst the thousands of Judah. And then he's from this family of the Danites. And we mentioned about the Danites. And I want to just go back and see uh, Genesis 49. You remember how uh, Jacob uh, kind of had a message of prophecy about his sons and their future. And this is what he has to say about Dan. And hardly complimentary. Imagine your, your uh, father's on his deathbed and you, he calls all the siblings around. And then he speaks to you. And, and this is what he says. Dan shall be a serpent, by the way. You're like This guy's a snake. I mean, that's not, you know, you wouldn't like your dad saying that. Well, <clears throat> uh, this, this son of mine, he's a real snake. A serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backwards. And the simple idea is this, that treacherous, right? Dangerous and treacherous, just like a snake. And so uh, there, uh, what we might say is Dan is the treacherous tribe. They can't be trusted. Uh, and um, some scholars believe, and again, I, I don't want to be dogmatic on this, but some scholars believe that the man of sin will most likely come from the tribe of Dan, this serpent tribe, you see, treacherous. And uh, so uh, certainly a tribe of Dan does not acquit itself well in the scriptures. And we'll see more of that as we continue in the book of Judges. Uh, we'll see that the tribe of Dan is not exactly the best tribe. And so <clears throat> it certainly didn't acquit itself well. And so Samson comes from a hornet's nest of a place and from a treacherous tribe. Not exactly the most remarkable beginning. Of course, Dan was supposed to have driven the people out of the land, the Philistines. That was their territory and they had failed. And it takes us really back to the, the beginning of the book of Judges. And I want us to go back to chapter one, just to observe something uh, in, in Judges one, when we, we begin to see uh, them taking the land, uh, it says uh, in verse 19, the Lord was with Judah, he drove out the inhabitants of the mountains. But then verse 34, it tells us this, and the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountains, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. And so uh, what we see is the first, it's kind of a parallel with the judges. The first judge was from Judah and was successful. That's Othniel. The last judge is from Dan. And in chapter one, we have the first skirmish Judah success. The last one mentioned is Dan, ab abject failure. And so there's a, a definite parallel parallelism between chapter one and what we see here. So <clears throat> many, many of the tribe of Dan, as we will learn when we get to chapter 18, uh, they gave up on trying to take their inheritance. And they actually headed as far north as they could possibly get and still be in the land of Israel. <laughs> and so they actually head up to the, to the northern border with what we would now today call Lebanon. 
and they uh, they took land up there, and so they failed to really take their inheritance, and so many of them left. And uh, we're going to see actually the latter chapters are not chronological, and so many of them, had, uh, even when Samson is on the scene, many of them had already left, but uh, Manoah had stayed. He had stayed in his God-given inheritance. And so it tells us about this man whose name was Manoah. Samson's father was named Manoah. Now, if you know anything about Noah, you'll know that Noah means rest. And so here's a man who's at rest in a hornet's nest environment, which is quite remarkable to think. How could anybody uh, be at rest in a place like that? And uh, of course, as it, it speaks a little bit of lethargy, indifference, uh, couldn't care less attitude, settling down in the le- least ideal conditions. And then just uh, the last kind of stroke of the pen to set this scene. So here's this man whose name means rest in a place where it would be hard to rest because it's called Hornet's Nest. And then the final aspect of it is it tells us his wife was barren and bare not. A picture of a barren woman who could not bear children. So what we would say is it's an impossible situation, but that's the wonder of this chapter. When things seem impossible, when they seem bleak, when they seem hopeless, this is the time when God begins to work and show himself to be who he is, the great sovereign deliverer of his people. And so God begins to move. Even though they didn't cry out and ask for deliverance, deliverance, God begins to move. And of course, it's a great place to be where it seems like it's hopeless. And unless the Lord does something, it seems like it's over. That's a, in one sense, we don't like being there, but it's a good place to be because then we have to, as it were, is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Like we've given, we've tried everything we know to do and there's nothing to be done and we have to wait till God steps in. So notice it just calls this lady his wife. In fact, it's kind of fascinating as you read the chapter, um, we're never going to find out her name. And I looked on the internet and of course, there's a couple of suggestions, but you won't get it from the text of scripture. She's an unknown woman. Her only claim to fame is she's the wife of Manoah. And she's the mother of Samson, but we're never told who she is. And so I just want you to run down with me quickly just to see. Uh, Again, his wife was barren. Verse three, the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. Verse six, then the woman came and told her husband. And then verse nine, uh, God hearkened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of the Lord came unto the woman. Uh, Verse 10, and the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband. Uh, Verse 11, Manoah rose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Art thou the man that spake us unto the woman? Uh, uh, Verse 13, and the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. And we could go on, uh, you know, verse 19 talks about his wife, verse 20, his wife, verse 21, his wife. Verse 22, his wife, verse 23, his wife, verse 24, and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And so I I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but it really struck me this time as I was going through this passage that we just have no idea even the name of this woman. We know nothing about her other than she is the mother of Samson and the wife of Manoah. And it's interesting, uh, I, I might say this, there are a lot of unknown women who I'm sure have had a marvelous contribution to the work of God. We don't know who they are because, uh, you know, we we know a lot about different men, uh, how many preachers, their wives staying behind, uh, keeping the home fires burning, so to speak, have had a significant contribution, not only in the home, but maybe even in their husband's life, praying and all the rest of it. And so it's just, it's good to remind us that uh, there are people in scripture who were unnamed, relatively unknown, but very significant in the purposes of God. Of all the people that the angel of the Lord appeared to, he appeared to her. He didn't even appear to Manoah, appeared to the woman (laughs) and the weaker vessel and began to reveal things to her. And so again, just recognize this. uh, uh, God uses obscure people to do his work. 
Praise God for that. And we may never get our name in the limelight, so to speak, but it doesn't mean that God can't use us and use us significantly to affect the generation to come. And certainly that's the case here. So then we have this appearance of the angel of the Lord. It says in verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So, as we said, Menor and his wife were, humanly speaking, in an impossible situation, and only God could answer the need. In fact, we don't even read about her praying about her barren state. It's almost like, again, they had accepted it. Um, we, we don't see that with other women. Uh, we see, Rachel, give, give me children or else I die. We see Hannah uh, desperate for a child. But we don't see any of that in, in, in uh, Manoah's wife. And so maybe there were just an acceptance. This is the way it is. And so often we can just settle down and accept it and say this is the way it is uh, without really crying out to the Lord. So they're in this impossible situation. And the fact that the Lord appeared to her first rather than to Manoah reflected the spiritual state of the children of Israel. The Lord chose to work through the weaker vessel to emphasize it was only his strength working through his people's weakness that would bring deliverance. He appears directly to the weaker vessel. And by the way, just as an aside, how often in Scripture do we see this pattern of God stepping in and beginning with a baby? It's kind of an interesting thing. Isaac, the child of promise. Moses, the deliverer from Egypt. Samuel, when all seemed hopeless towards the end of the book of Judges. And then after 400 years of silence at the close of the Old Testament, the New Testament begins with a birth announcement. And here comes a baby, John the baptizer. Kind of interesting, isn't it, how uh, we, we see God beginning to work, interrupting things by the birth of a baby. Uh, and, of course, what's interesting about these births uh, they were miraculous births, often barren women. It's interesting. We're going to see that uh, uh, this man is a Nazarite uh, from birth. And the three Nazarites from birth we know of all came out of barren wombs. You have, of course, Samson. You have Samuel. Do you remember? Hannah was barren. And then the third one is John the Baptizer, three Nazarites we know of in Scripture coming out of the barren womb of Elizabeth. So just an interesting observation and significant, really, that these individuals that would be so used of God uh, to begin to affect deliverance for the people of God came out of those circumstances. Also, it's just interesting in church history that sometimes uh, when things are bleak, a godly mother can begin to change the tide of things. We think about Hannah and her working uh, in Samuel, giving him to the Lord. We, we see the same with John and Charles Wesley, Susanna Wesley, uh, again, just as it were, impacting the lives of these children who would impact the nation for God. And it's interesting that, that there are those that it seems from Scripture are set apart from their mother's womb, for divine service. We think of Saul of Tarsus. And uh, of course, we all know the story well, uh, but Galatians 1 and verse 15 tells us that Paul understood that God was at work even before his birth in his, uh, in, while he was still in the womb. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15 says, when it pleased God who separated me, from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. <laughs> and so, again, just amazing to think. And again, as we look at our day, as bleak as it is, maybe some woman with child could have the, the instrument God will use to bring revival once again to the people of God, to turn the, we don't know, or maybe some one already born, but, but being raised in a home could be the instrument God could use to bring deliverance. We also notice that God is not in a hurry. They've had 40 years of bondage. 
And now they have to wait nine months for the baby to reach full term. And then how many years before he's able to take on the Philistines and begin deliverance? And, and sometimes in scripture, we see that there's a, there's a divine leisureliness about God. We're always in a rush. Uh, we, we're always uh, living in the urgent. We need this now. This has to happen now. But God is not in such a hurry. In fact, even with the birth of Messiah, you think of the age is rolling on. And then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. And we see, again, it was in his perfect timing. So, again, we ask the question, who is this angel of the Lord who appeared to the wife of Manoah? Of course, uh, the Lord drawing near to what would seem to be a fairly faithful family, believing family, in dark days. Notice just how this, this angel of the Lord is described, as well as the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. Uh, we just notice some things. Uh, it, verse 6, the woman came and told the husband, saying, a man of God came to me. So obviously, he's an angel. He's a messenger of God, but he's coming in the appearance of a human form, a man of God. And then it says, his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. So obviously, although there's a humanity aspect, there's, there's, there's something different. There's, a, there's an evidence of, of something heavenly about this messenger, uh, a countenance of an angel of God, very terrible, very awesome. Uh, to see him. And of course, often angels appear like men, but they appear with a bright countenance, don't they? And so this angel of the Lord, uh, of course, at verse nine, uh, it says, <clears throat> oh, sorry, verse eight, the menorah entreated the Lord and said, oh, my Lord, let the man of God, which thou, thou send come again to us. So again, we have this. And then verse 10, the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, behold, the man hath appeared unto me. And then verse 22, we get a, a final kind of uh, description of this angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. <laughs> Interesting. We've asserted uh, throughout this study that the appearances of the angel of the Lord in the book of Judges are what we would call pre-incarnate manifestations of the eternal Son of God, what we would call Christophanies, okay, or theophanies, because Christ is truly God. Uh, but uh, certainly, I believe that that is exactly what's going on here. This is a Christophany or theophany, a pre-incarnate visitation of the eternal Son of God, the Lord from heaven. And what is going to support that um, thesis is verse 19. It says, so Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock, and the Lord and the angel did wondrously. And then uh, stepping back a bit, uh, <clears throat> he wants to know what, what his name is. Verse 18, the angel of the Lord said unto him, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret. King James says, seeing it secret. But that word in Hebrew is the same word, wonderful. And it's found in a couple of places, uh, how that word is translated as wonderful. Uh, his name is wonderful. Uh, let's just look at a couple of them. Psalm 139, verse 6. Psalm 139, verse 6. And then the one that I know you're familiar of and wondering why I haven't turned there first, but we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Psalm 139, verse 6, it says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. That's the, exactly the same Hebrew word as the word used for secret in our passage here, verse 18 of chapter 13. And then, of course, one more. And that is Isaiah's glorious prophecy concerning the Messiah and what it says concerning him. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Because name is indicative of character, and certainly this this revelation of the pre-incarnate eternal Son of God He really is wonderful. We often like to sing, his name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. And of course, he is wonderful. And uh, of course, causes wonder, causes worship, causes amazement. And so without hesitation, I want to say the appearance of the angel Lord uh, was indeed the manifestation of the pre-incarnate Christ. Now, let me just go on a step further and say this, that I believe that after the incarnation, there's no more appearances of the angel of the Lord. Because when the Lord Jesus took on humanity, that additional nature of humanity, it was a permanent thing. And so he forever uh, is as we often say, there's a man in the glory. Now he's a he's a he's also fully divine, but nevertheless, uh, I don't believe there's any clear revelation of the angel of the Lord. There are many of them in the Old Testament, but none in the New Testament after the incarnation, because the Lord Jesus no longer appears in his pre-incarnate form. He forever will be in his incarnated form. So why did the angel appear at this time? Well, to instruct the wife of Manoah that not only was she going to bear a child, but how this child is to be treated. I want you to notice uh, that the first thing he says in verse 3, the angel Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not. And he's kind of, you know, for a barren woman... (laughs) who would be very sensitive about that. It almost seems a little bit blunt and insensitive to kind of say that. Uh, And yet he does have good news for her. He says, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And then verse four, now therefore beware, I pray thee. And so he's given instructions to her and he's telling her, Drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. So during her pregnancy, she, in a sense, is to uh, be a picture of what Samson is to be. She is to be separated. Uh, She's to to separate herself from wine or strong drink. And she's also to be very careful that she does not eat any unclean thing. And so uh, it was she, she is to set a good example for the coming one who was to be separated. She is to kind of, as it were, pave the way uh, in development. And it's interesting how uh, during pregnancy, it is interesting how what a person does apparently can affect the child. Uh, They do say that smoking during pregnancy will affect the size of the child. They do say that Uh, A lot of alcohol during the pregnancy can have an effect on the child. So certainly here, at least she's going to have an effect. She's going to provide the right environment for this child. And then it says um, in verse five, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come on his head for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And so, I want to think a little bit about the Nazarite. And of course, we've talked a little bit, I believe, about this in past times, but we want to just think a little bit about it, uh, kind of compulsory reading at this moment, if we're really to understand Judges chapter 13, we have to go back to the book of Numbers in chapter 6 to at least understand that, of course, this is going to be compulsory reading, not just for this particular moment in in Judges, but throughout the life of Samson, we want to keep in mind what a Nazarite was and how successful he was in keeping the vow of the Nazarite. And so it's important that we go look at chapter six in Numbers. So let's do that for a moment. Numbers chapter six. 
<clears throat> and verses one through eight talk about the vow of the Nazarite. The rest of the chapter talks about what happens if he breaks that vow. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it says uh, in verse one, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar or of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat most moist grapes and dried. And all the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. So we have three areas that are going to be brought before us in Numbers chapter 6. Uh, one is abstinence from wine, during the course of the vow or anything connected with the the the, the vine tree, so to speak. Uh, secondly, we're going to see that uh, there's one concerning the hair, that he's not to put a razor on his head all the days of his vow. And the third one is that he can't touch a dead body. We'll elaborate on all three of them, but I want to just mention them. And it's kind of interesting. If you like alliteration, I find this interesting. Uh, one vow concerned his appearance. You see, he's going to have long hair. If a man have long hair, it is what scripture says. Shame unto him. Okay. So his appearance is going to be different from everybody else. He's going to have long hair. And so his appearance will be affected. His appetite. Uh, wine was a normal thing for people to drink, right? It was a pretty normal thing. And people enjoy drinking wine. And so he had to limit his appetite. He could not drink anything connected with the vine and then finally, his affections, his love for his family, even if a close loved one would die, he couldn't break the vow to go to them. And so it, appearance, appetite, affections are all set apart to God. Uh, uh, what he's saying, and we're going to see this, is that uh, his love for God supersedes other things. He cares more about his love for God than he does his appearance. He cares more about his love for God than he does his appetite. He cares more about his love for God than he does his affections. That's the idea of the vow of the Nazarite. So the first thing is no wine, strong drink, or anything connected with the fruit of the vine. Now, wine is symbolic in scriptures. We've already learned of joy in, and pleasure. Uh, a supreme, His supreme joy during the course of his vow was not was not to be found in the artificial stimulants of the world, but his supreme joy was to be found in the service of God. He was not looking anywhere else for joy, but in divine service. He was not dependent on earthly stimulation, nor was he seeking earthly joy, but his joy was in serving and delighting to serve God. And then he, the next thing is, verse 5 of Numbers chapter 6, all the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head till the days be fulfilled in which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall, shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So again, no razor on his head. And during the period of his vow, he's saying during his vow, he doesn't care about his appearance. His only concern is serving God. And we said the long hair for a man is shameful for him, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And the Nazarite was willing to bear the shame and rejection and reproach out of his devotion to the Lord. It was a visible sign of his separation from the world and his willingness to bear the shame, rejection, and reproach of his devotion to the Lord. And again, one, once more, we find that Samson, in, in a sense, points us towards Christ. Although the Lord Jesus was not a literal Nazarite, because remember, they accused him of being a wine bibber and a drunkard. So he clearly did not abstain from wine. And yet, he was, in one sense, the only true Nazarite to walk the earth because his supreme joy was found in doing the will of the Father like no one else. Uh, his joy was in his service to God, uh, even his appetites. Remember the woman of Samaria and the disciples said, did you have any, any food? And he says, uh, my meat, the thing that satisfies me, 
is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And so clearly the, the true Nazarite, the one who was truly separated to God more than any other was the Lord Jesus. Now, I want to just say this, that some have confused the term Nazarite with Nazareth. And so they have uh, certainly in medieval art, there are pictures uh, that you'll be well aware of, of the Lord Jesus looking something like a San Francisco hippie, long hair, flowing beards, you know, the whole picture. And I just want to tell you that that is absolutely inaccurate. Uh, I have no question in my mind that the Lord Jesus kept his hair short. His Nazarite ship was connected with his divine service. And uh, uh, not Nazareth and Nazarite are not connected uh, in any way, uh, but he he served the Lord with great devotion. And so his life uh, was one of c- complete devotion to the Father and obedience to his will. But the Nazarite, again, he was willing to bear that shame and reproach. And then it, for, third thing is, uh, in verses six to eight, it says, all the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head all the days of separation. He is holy unto the Lord. And so even the closest of family relationships will not distract him from the service of God. This is the vow of the Nazarite. Now, it's voluntary. And for for most uh, cases, uh, it was just for a period of time. It wouldn't be a lifelong thing. In fact, um, as we've already mentioned, the only ones who were lifelong Nazarites were those that were Nazarites from their womb, Samson, Samuel, John the Baptist. Every other Nazarite was, they took a vow. Some believe the Apostle Paul uh, had the Nazarite vow for a time. Uh, When he went to Jerusalem, uh, he shaved his head. And of course, then he uh, paid his vow, so to speak, uh, or his offering. Look at the book of Amos just for a second. I want us just to see something in the Minor Prophets that is of interest concerning Nazarites and how they were appreciated in some ways and yet corrupted in other ways. Amos 2, verse 11 and 12, he says, And I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. It is not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord, but you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. So even in the darkest times of Israel's history, there were the Nazarites, there were the prophets. But tragically, God's people, the children of Israel, they tried to corrupt the Nazarites. <laughs> they gave them wine to drink. They tried to, well, they refused to listen to the voice of the prophets. But certainly, uh, the implication is that these, these were a blessing from God to the nation, that he sent Nazarites, people who were separated to God. So back again to our passage in Judges chapter 13. I want us just to notice one more thing about this birth announcement. It says he'll be a Nazarite to God, verse 5, from the womb. So this is a permanent thing. Uh, And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And so he shall begin to deliver Israel. This is, again, the only judge who began to do this he began a work that others, as we know, would finish. I want to just say this, that there, there, there are men that start things, and that God uses them in starting something, but they may not bring it to completion. But thank God that they started something. I, I think of the, uh, the famous Welsh revival in 1904, and instrumental in starting that revival was Evan Roberts. And for a time, he was involved in the revival, but then he fades off the scene. But he's got it started, and God used him to do that. And God is going to use Samson to start something. It will take a while for it to be completed, but praise God, he got it started, and he did that. And so <clears throat> I want to think a little bit about the 
the par- the parents here and the preparation of the home. And again, very important, really, in a sense. Um, Manoah's wife is being addressed. And, of course, it's the woman's role to guard the home. Just look at Titus chapter 2 for a second. And we just want to think about this because that's one of her great responsibilities is to be a uh, to guard the home to uh, to keep the home from corruption <coughs> Titus 2 verse 5 to be discreet chaste keepers at home good obedient to their own husbands that the word of god be not blasphemed now this phrase keepers at home if you understand the english keep is connected with a castle and it's connected with a drawbridge and you know, protection, keeping the gates closed to not allow enemies in. And so the idea is this, that as the house manager, <clears throat> she is to keep out from the, uh, of the home anything that would corrupt. And so certainly we see this role has been given to this woman. She's to prepare the home. And how does she prepare the home? By her own example. She's not to drink wine. She's not to eat anything unclean. And so this deliverer is placed into this environment. And it's vital to prepare the home for a child's coming so that the child can be raised to be an effective warrior for God. And certainly this is her responsibility. Again, I'm reminded of Psalm 127, a beautiful psalm. And it tells us something very interesting about children and the whole process of raising children. It says, Psalm 127, verse 3, Lord, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Then it says this, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty one, so are the children of thy youth. In other words, it's during their, their childhood and youth that they're being formed and shaped to be devastating arrows that will do uh, do its work in the enemy's life. Uh, so the children, uh, it says, uh, as arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so the children and the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And so certainly this is the responsibility. And again, a lot of parallels between Judges and Second Timothy a day of departure, a day of failure, and yet there's a, a little boy who's got a godly mother and a godly grandmother, and they invest in that young little lad, Timothy, and they pour the scriptures into him, and he would be somebody God would take up and use in a day of great failure and a great departure. And again, we see that same principle here, that God is going to use this couple to raise up a Nazarite who will serve the Lord in a marvelous way. And so a Nazarite to God from his room. And in a a very real sense, um, I want to just kind of maybe finish with this, that um, although for us, there's no sense of, okay, I'm going to take a vow of a Nazarite. I'm going to let my hair grow, all this kind of stuff. But certainly for us, there are claims of God upon us. We've been bought with a price. And our responsibility is to glorify God in our bodies, which he has redeemed at such great price. And a life of separation, and it is interesting um, that this life of separation, it, it means abstaining from things that might well be legitimate to other people. And it also, there's a separation from, and often is lacked is a separation to. During the vow, the Nazarite, was to separate himself from certain things, but he was to separate himself unto the Lord all the days of his vow. And surely that's something needed greatly today is for people who are separated from the unclean and yet at the same time are devoted to the Lord in divine service. And we need both for sure. And uh, of course, for the children of Israel, this was very important because remember, they've come to accept Philistine dominion and Philistine ways. And so this Nazarite, this separated life is is going to speak to them because they have abandoned their distinctive features as a nation. They've, as it were, been absorbed and become 
a, a kind of acceptance of the Philistine way of things. And so Samson was begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. He would do a work that would be completed later, but nevertheless, he would be a stark example to them. And what we're going to say is this, and we'll, we'll close with this, is that Samson, he certainly was better than his contemporaries, but not much better. <laughs> and that's the tragedy, isn't it? And it reminds us in the last days that it's possible to be better than our contemporaries, but not to be much better. <laughs> and oh, how we should be significantly different to those around us. May God help us to ponder these things, to meditate on these things, and by grace apply them to our own lives and hearts. Amen.